Okay, just making sure I've got the recording going. Okay, great. Um, so today, take that little, if you have me off, um, we're going to talk about uh, simulation. So the last sort of few weeks, uh, we've sort of introduced the notion of uh, ignorance in modeling and uh, probability as a way of representing uncertainty. Um, and what we want to do today is really sort of move to, I guess, the core object that uh, we'd like to work with when um, doing machine learning in the physical world, certainly for this course, which is um, the notion of a simulation. So I want to sort of start by, um, so you'll remember, I, I quite like uh, Laplace's demon, and it talks about sort of knowing uh, all the natural laws of the universe and the constituent uh, represent, well, where everything is within that universe and having the ability to compute. So I, I just want to give this example because I think it's a powerful example to show us uh, what the sort of problem is here. So does anyone know who that, who that is? John Conway. John Conway, very good. And I like that because in that picture, he looks a little bit like a sort of Renaissance representation of God. <laughs> um, and in this little representation here, he, he is very much God because we're going to talk about a world that he created called the game of life. So the game of life is a cellular automata that I think he um, was thinking about in 1969. And in a cellular automata, what we have is we've got a grid of pixels and pixels are either alive or dead. And I've represented living pixels here as black and dead pixels as white. So the world lives on a grid. And so in that sort of a plast statement, we can actually know the state of the entire universe because it's just this grid of pixels, which is black and white. Um, and then there's sort of rules. So there's rules in this universe, which are very simple. So it's basically sort of three rules. The first is that if a pixel, like this pixel on the left here, um, is alive, then what the game's a discrete game. So in, if, in one turn, it's alive. And then in the next turn, what happens to it? If it's only surrounded by uh, two other pixels or less, so two or fewer pixels, then it dies. Now, I haven't shown what happens to the other pixels. They would actually both die as well because they would be lonely. So that's what happens in the next turn. And it's a sequential game. So you just keep taking these turns. So that's, that's the first rule. The next rule is that if a pixel is surrounded by four or more uh, living pixels in a given turn, it also dies through overcrowding. So in this case, again, something would happen to the pixels around it, but I'm just showing that central pixel. That pixel dies because it's overcrowded because it's surrounded by four pixels. And then finally, there's a, there's a happier rule. And the happier rule is birth, which is, um, well, and of course, the same thing applies. If, if you're surrounded by three pixels and you're dead, then you're born in the next round, okay? Also, um, I haven't, there's a sort of, I suppose, a fourth rule there, that if you are surrounded by three and only three, then you just stay in the steady side because you don't uh, die through loneliness or overcrowding. So this, this sort of, this is a happy state that you're surrounded by three other pixels. And my understanding is Conway spent quite a lot of time working with these rules because he was trying to find a set of very simple rules that, that lead to quite complex behavior. And what's nice about that is we now have a universe where what Laplace said is, is true, right? So we can be aware of all the rules of the universe because I've just said what they are, they're very, very simple. We can also be aware of the location of all the constituent beings in that universe. And this is the sort of effect you get. So this is the glider that was discovered in 1969. I can't remember the name of the gentleman who discovered it. It's in the notes, but it was a colleague of Conway's or someone who knew about the rules before they were even published. And you get these effects where this is a sort of, um, so this is a, an oscillating pattern, but it shifts as it oscillates. So you get these effects where you get these oscillating patterns that will stay, have a certain period. So you've got some period to this pattern, but this pattern also shifts down diagonally. And, and these patterns are called spaceships in the game. Um, and they move around about the game 
in this sort of interesting way. And so that was sort of worked out that this was going to happen, I guess, by people working on pieces of paper with pencils, because you, in 1969, you wouldn't have bothered coding this up to sort of test this out. You would, it was, oddly, it was easier to compute it by hand um, still. So that's called the glider, and that's great. And then there's this really, cool, I, can't, I can't remember the date for this. I think it's in the notes. This is called the um, Gosper glider gun. So people worked out patterns that create these gliders. So this is a pattern that's just, it's just obeying these very simple rules, but it, it's doing these quite complex things. And in this case, it's, it's creating these patterns of gliders. And this happens in, in lots of simple systems. So if we look at um, things like Navier-Stokes equations, it's just obeying Newtonian mechanics in compressible fluids. But the result of Navier-Stokes equations and energy coming in in certain ways is things like hurricanes. So you have some of these low level phenomena that describe the way the universe is operating to some extent, but then they lead to these things that, that we see at much larger macroscopic scales that, that you wouldn't necessarily know exist that you have to search for. So I think there was an award for, for finding this gun um, that was gonna create these things over time. So that's sort of pretty cool. Um, now here's another thing, this is a loafer. So this is another spaceship. And this spaceship was only discovered in 2013. So it's a different spaceship, it's larger and it moves quite slowly, uh, sort of, I mean, it's moving to the left here, but it could move up and down, obviously. It's, so it's moving sort of with the pixels rather than diagonally across the pixels. Um, Conway unfortunately died uh, fairly recently. I think, of, I think it was of complications due to COVID. Um, but I kind of find it interesting. So, so you can sort of see the God of this game doesn't know this exists. So, so even when we've got this situation that is described that we know all the rules of the universe and we know where all the data is in the universe, the creator can't know what's going to happen because what, what, are, the, what are they missing? What's the one piece we're missing there? Computation. computation, yeah. So there's a sort of computational search to explore this system to try and find out what happens. So I really like this system because it sort of illustrates very strongly that even when you, you know, you might think, oh, well, of course, we don't know all the laws of the universe yet, or, or we don't know, it's, of course, we can't know where everything is. But even when you can know all of that, you end up in this situation where you're finding things. Because, of course, the number of possible things you can create, the number of possible worlds is, is enormous because of, you know, it's two to the number of pixels. Um, so th this, uh, I particularly like. So what you're seeing here is there's a video online that I, I found when I was searching this last year. I can't remember the name of the pixel, but what you're seeing is the game of life. And we're zooming out from the game of life. And what you're seeing emerging here on the right hand side is a pixel being generated by the game of life. So this is the game of life being implemented in the game of life. As we zoom out, there's a, a glider that's being generated underneath everything by the game of life. And there you're seeing those are, those are glider guns that are being interacting there because what happens is these gliders, when they hit each other, they will disappear. Uh, they'll kill each other if they hit each other in certain ways. So you can actually implement logic in the game of life. And indeed you can implement a Turing machine in the game of life. But I just think that this is a really beautiful thing. So this, th these simple rules can compute anything, right? So in some sense, these simple rules can do anything our computers can do. And yet when you write that down, you don't know that. And in fact, it took a long time for people to be able to show, I can't remember the name, it's called a something or other megapixel. It's a, you know, obviously once you've got one, you can tie them together. And, and have it implement the game of life. I just think that's a really stark illustration of like, you know, um, the, the sort of problems you're getting with your ignorance. And here your ignorance is purely due to compute. And a lot of um, what we're focused on in this course really is, is that piece of ignorance um, because we're interested in simulations. So uh, if you want, I, I sort of cribbed all this. One of the things um, I think is very clear in the pandemic is yes, academics can make videos, but there are other people who do it professionally and they're a lot better at it. Um, so I, I totally cribbed this stuff from this fantastic video um, 
uh, someone who's doing, I can't remember his name, it's in the notes, you, you can watch it, it's much more entertaining than I am. Um, but he won't turn up live here, whereas I will. <laughs> okay, so I want to think a bit about that in the context of what we've been talking about so far, which was around Gaussian process. So what Carl was sort of showing us was a world where if I think about a Gaussian process, what I think we have the capability to do is um, we can simulate worlds just like you can simulate worlds in the game of life, but the worlds we simulate are these functions and, and they have certain characteristics and I've chosen to simulate functions here that are um, infinitely differentiable and they have a certain length scale, they vary over a certain time and a certain overall scale. And the really nice thing we get in um, uh, Gaussian processes is, yes, we can simulate many of these things. And then the sort of trick, the thing that we might want to do is say, well, which, which of these explanations we have for our observations are the correct or are they are consistent with, with the observations? So what we're often doing, this is the process of Bayesian inference in general, is I start, as, as Carl was nicely representing last week, I start with a, um, a view of the world which has a number of uh, functions that I believe could exist. And then I observe a, a couple of observations from my world, right? So, and, and what I get is I can eliminate all those worlds that are inconsistent with those observations. This is actually the process of Bayesian inference. So what we have in that case is that that's our prior, that's our data. So this would be like the um, Fs in the uh, probability of F star given F. And then that's our updated posterior, but I'm just showing you samples from it here. So what I'm showing is that I've simulated these thousand worlds and I'm showing you the remaining samples that are consistent. I've decided to find some error. I've defined some noise. So I'm, I'm rejecting ones. Obviously none of them will go precisely through the data point, right? So I'm choosing to use some error. So I'm rejecting ones that are a certain distance away. And this is the, the piece of the world that is left that is consistent with my hypothesis which is that Gaussian process prior about the functions of the way the world works and my data. So this is my updated belief about the way the world looks and it's being expressed you know, with uncertainty. But the beautiful thing with the Gaussian process is that's analytic. So most of the time, sort of almost all of the time, you can't do this analytically. And, and that's kind of the real problem we face, that the sort of things that you might want to express about your belief about the way the world operates are difficult to express analytically in mathematics. As I always have this sort of notion, it took me a while to notice this, but it's kind of obvious in retrospect. So maybe I'm just stupid or maybe it's really deep. Um, <laughs> uh, there's only a few bits of maths that actually work, right? So linear algebra is one of them. Um, and What's, what's really odd in machine learning statistics and applied maths, what you find is everyone's doing the same pieces of maths and you end up with arguments across them about, oh, you're doing it wrong, you should be doing this bit next, you should be doing that bit next. No, it's, it's kind of like you're on a journey somewhere on a path across a landscape and you meet someone else who's on that path. You can't assume they're going the same place as you. That's just like, it's the fence. Everywhere off that path is un trackable. You start walking there, you can only go far, you know, and you're weighed down with slowness because of the boggy fence, right? So the fact that they're on that path is just because that's the way you can move quickly across the landscape. And linear algebra is one aspect of that. Why they're in that landscape or what they're doing will vary according to the philosophy of the field, whether that's applied maths, statistics, or machine learning. And I find it incredibly frustrating the silly things people say about these are all the same because look, they're using the same maths or the same models because that's not what it's about. It's actually about the philosophy of why they're using them and how they're deploying them. But having said all that, it's most interesting when you gather all those communities together and talk about what you can do when you combine your strengths a little bit like in power ranges where at the end they all collect together and form the super bot thing which you always well why didn't they just do that in the beginning so we're trying to do that in the beginning rather than failing we combine across these fields but we need to respect the powers of each individual power ranger and what they bring to the battle right unfortunately the world isn't as gaussian as we might like it to be. But one of the really, really cool things is it was once almost totally Gaussian. So can someone tell me what that is? Yeah, so the cosmic microwave background turns out to be a Gaussian process. 
And well, I'm not a physicist. Anyone here, physicist or cosmologist? Brilliant. So you'd know more about this than me. But the Planck spaceship was sent up to try and detect non Gaussianity in the uh, uh, cosmic microwave wave background, the anisotropy, because I think, according to the standard model, it's a Gaussian process. Am I getting this right? Shake your head vigorously. If, yeah, it's roughly right. This is good enough for computer scientists and the rest of us. Um, because uh, the stand, according to the standard model, it should be a Gaussian process. And, and unfortunately, they didn't, weren't able to detect any non Gaussianity in that. So they couldn't sort of discard, couldn't reject the standard model, uh, which is what people were hoping would happen, because then you could sort of say there must be new physics. Um, so in the, um, in the uh, notes, you've got a little fun thing that comes from my colleague, Carl Kramer. He put me onto it and some other colleagues he knows, where you actually can sample universes from the Gaussian process. So um, something happened, you know, you've got the Big Bang and then you've got all this inflation stuff going on that I don't really understand, but I like to read about because it sounds cool. Um, so we know inflation happened because the temperature on one side of the universe is the same as the temperature on the other side of the universe, apart from some very, very small fluctuations in temperature, which means that they must have been information connected at some point before inflation. Um, and they're not information connected now. And those fluctuations are very, very small in variance, but they are Gaussian. And they are the fluctuations that determine what the form of the universe is today, because those variations in temperature is what leads to the variations in density that leads to everything else coming out. So you, you can sample for these Gaussian processes and generate new universes. Of course, what you won't, won't have time to do, just like Conway, is um, do the next bit, because what you're seeing with the cosmic microwave background is when you know everything starts condensing and starts becoming non-Gaussian because the, the heat is coming out of it. And you get what we're observing today is something that this is a non-linear function of whatever that was. So that's what I think cosmologists will do in their simulations. They try and take this Gaussian initialization. And then the, the, the nonlinear function is like the understanding of sort of physics as it progresses to see that you actually get a world with non-Gaussian entities in it like ourselves today. So it, it's true that the world, the universe isn't Gaussian, but it wants what, which I kind of like. So, I mean, it's nice that you would have been able to predict sort of accurately everything that would have happened in that universe, but a shame that you couldn't have been there to do it as it were. Um, so this sort of links to this thing, this quote that I gave sort of before. So if we do discover a theory of everything, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reasoning for then we would truly know the mind of God. But the mind of God we would know is the Conway mind of God, right? It's the Conway who has described this universe and but you're still stuck. You don't necessarily know what's gonna happen. I was going to say, I think might, uh, a difference might be, I'm assuming of course, which is a big assumption for the universe is super deterministic, is that there is already a given initialization state for this universe. Whereas in Congress came up like the interfering with it directly and then what would differences to that? Um, so would the analogy still necessarily apply? Um wow. Yeah, now you now it's so now we, we're going into rare genes, which are probably well outside by remit, but like there's like multiverse theories as well, right? So okay, there's multiple so philosophically you're saying then it projects into a deterministic thing just like for instance in common being applied once you decide on the initial probably predict how the gliders are going to be functioning how the interactions are going to occur well i think you can predict at points right and i think that's the sort of thing that um you the notion that you can predict everything i think is likely wrong because uh so we're going somewhat into philosophy here but there's these other weird things that like elon musk likes to think about aren't there like um oh what if we're our universe is just a simulation well the i think the counter argument to those sort of things well actually the amount of computational power you would need to run that simulation means it's effectively a universe unless what you would have to do is you would have to have this capability to abstract at the right level the bits of the universe you weren't computing on, right? And this is kind of the game that we're going to play, like when we do these things. So you either, it's a simulation, well, for it to be an accurate simulation, it must represent everything that's going on. And because of chaos, therefore, you must be actually computing everything, therefore, it's a universe. Or, yes, it's possible that things are being simulated, um, but in order to do so cleverly, there'll be, there'll be shortcuts being taken in how and where you compute. Um, to move forward. 
So, and that's kind of, um, that's the same for Conway's game of life as it is for us trying to predict weather, right? So, you know, in, 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 this, in this God that Hawking defines here, um, that God doesn't necessarily know hurricanes exist, right? Unless they can do the computation to go forward, just as, just as uh, Conway doesn't know the loafer exists. Does that okay? Oh, we can chat afterwards as well. Yeah. But that, but that's kind of what I think things come down to is how you do things when you're handicapped in this way. So I mean, that's just the restatement of Laplace's demon, um, which we which we can relate to that sort of statement by Hawking and this piece again that you know that we think of as quite fundamental that you've got this combination of the data the model and your ability to compute to make predictions other questions at that point so of course we have laplace's gremlin though which is the fact that we don't know these things and even in that case where even in that case where we, we were to know uh, in the hawking model the mind of God, or in the Conway model, we still don't know how things are necessarily going to pan out without doing the computation. And computation requires work, right? There's some really nice stuff on the theory of computation. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so computation is doing something itself. It's, it's not a free thing. Uh, and it requires uh, energy and or time in order to do. So given that we're typically wanting to make decisions where we're we have a constraint on our resource of energy and or time, then we also have a constraint on our computation. Okay, so, so what does that mean? Well, I really like this uh, notion from Popper, which is, so Popper is famous for the philosophy of, philosophy, philosophy of science. Um, and what he sort of says, so Popper has this, interesting history that he grows up in Vienna at around a time when there's lots of stuff going on in Vienna, um, including he and his friends go on a Marxist march and a number of his friends get shot at and some of his friends die. And uh, at a very similar time, Einstein comes to Vienna and gives a talk about um, general, or I suppose it's a special relative general point. Anyway, talk about the fact that Newtonian gravitational understanding is being overturned. And shortly after that, Eddington, who was well over there, I suppose, in the Cavendish lab, goes on an expedition to, uh, uh, I think it's South Africa somewhere, isn't it? And, and films the solar eclipse that shows light bends in a way that's consistent with Einstein and inconsistent with Newton. Um, and this seems to have a really big effect on uh, Popper, who is also the psychoanalysts in Vienna at the time, who starts trying to differentiate between sort of Marxist theories, having seen his friend's shot, psychoanalyst theories, and the sort of theories that are coming out of physics. And, and his idea is that um, the difference in science is that you challenge your assumptions and you attempt to refute them. So he comes up with this sort of thing that the, the, the idea of science is to produce a theory and then attack the theory and try and refute it. And that's translated very much in, um, I think a lot of scientists mind into, well, I'm gonna run an experiment and do the statistics and do some hypothesis testing. But the, if you read sort of conjectures and refutations, there's this passage in it that I really like that he says, the difference between um, a, so his language would be like an experiment and a hypothesis for which I would translate to us, uh, hypothesis being a model and experiment being data is which comes first, the experiment or the hypothesis, is the same as the question which comes first, the chicken or the egg? And the answer is that they co-evolve. And I think that's a really powerful statement because it captures the way we're often doing science and trying to develop our understanding of these systems. The way I translated that at the time when I was doing a lot of computational biology is that you will start with an initial course experiment. That actually, when you, when you acquire data from a biological system, that's encapsulating something about your hypothesis about how that's working. It's actually quite difficult to express mathematically. So you choose to acquire data from your system. And then once you've done that, you do some analysis on your data. And if it's a sort of, as we were doing at the time, which were sort of micro experiments for RNA in cells, the very typical thing you would do is you would perturb the system in some way, acquire a load of microarray data, and then do some analysis with something very, very simple like principal component analysis. 
And then you would try and look at that and see, well, which genes are doing something unusual. And then you would drill down on those genes and start to form a more evolved and more detailed hypothesis about how they were interacting and what was interacting. And then you would test that with a further experiment. So you get this notion of the interaction between the experiment you do and the analysis you do, starting out in this very coarse way and then narrowing down to something that is much more focused, that is answering something much more specific. And I think that that's a very natural way of thinking about it. So this diagram comes from when I was in Amazon supply chain and it's sort of taking those ideas and in the Amazon supply chain case, the question you had was, um, what changes should we make to our sort of business logic in order to reduce the cost of sustaining the supply chain? And there you had a situation where your supply chain is operating something like a billion items you have for sale, you know, and your, I don't know, the scale at which you're delivering is kind of enormous. So you don't just play with the system, right? What you do is you develop simulations of your underlying system. And those simulations have different levels of fidelity and different levels of granularity. So they capture some essence of your, of your system and you test your ideas on those simulations. Now, each of those simulations turns out to have different fidelities. So some of those simulations are very coarse. They're sort of like roughly things we expect to work like this. Other of those simulations involve running the actual code base of Amazon on fake data. But those simulations, given like, so something like, so the way that Amazon purchasing works is it, there's a buying run, run every week. Um, and so you decide what, you look at the stock across the Amazon supply chain, and then you decide to issue purchase orders that week. And so you sort of have a week to do all the computation you need to decide your purchase orders across, you know, potentially a billion items that you may want to buy. And that's all automated. So if you want to do that and test that and say, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to provide some fake data. So that would be called counterfactual simulation that I'm going to rerun my, I'm going to say, what if this had been the input I put in to see what happens? That's also going to take a week, right? It takes the same amount of time as it takes to do it live. So what you do is you sort of start building simulations, which are abstractions of the actual code you have, right? So this is a sort of conceptual and interesting thing that you know what your actual business logic is, but rather than running your actual business logic, because it's too computa computationally intensive, you try and write a simulation that you think is capturing the essence of your business logic. And then by writing that simulation, you then ask questions of that. And that means you can run this cycle quicker because you can play with that and start exploring the space. What sort of interventions might bring about the result I want, which is sort of you know, lower prices or faster delivery or whatever I'm looking to um, include. So this sort of cycle of operation was something that we tried to bring right into the heart of the supply chain and basically say, look, we don't know what the supply chain in the future will look like, but what we do know is it'll be different to today. And what we do know is you will constantly want to be able to experiment on it and ask questions about it and try and deliver answers on those questions. And, and I think that philosophy is kind of true for, I mean, it actually came, I think for me, the origin of that philosophy was actually working with Formula One teams because you had the same you had a very clear uh, where you're trying to optimize a car design to go faster around a track. And there you sort of have the ability to do wind tunnel testing, CFD, and very limited track testing. And so your, your question is, how do I run these cycles? Well, you see them, they're running cycles of experimentation to try and modify the car to optimize it to get to perform on the track. And they're doing it over very short time frames because there's only sort of two weeks between races. So that type of idea, I think, is pervasive. And you can apply it sort of anywhere. So, you know, in any of your fields, the point in having these computational models is actually to run the real system is often very expensive or sometimes impossible. If you look at climate, it's impossible. We only have one Earth, right? But then you've got this ability to run a high fidelity simulation or a low fidelity simulation. Um, but you tend to run the low fidelity because you can get computation quicker. And this is the sort of challenge that we're facing, that, that uh, there's all models that we could represent of the way the universe works. That's my sort of alpha circle. But actually, so if we look at quantum mechanics, you know, some of those models of the way the universe works aren't even computable with our classical machines. 
So there's clearly models we have of the way the universe works that we actually can't compute in any sort of reasonable amount of time on a classical machine for any scale of system. Um, and so within that, there's a subset of the models that are computable, the ones that we can actually, we can now say the ones that we can run through the game of life. <laughs> Um, you know, the ones that we can run through a Turing machine. And then there's mathematically analytical models, ones where we can actually do the math. So like I did, uh, or like Carl Hendrick was showing us with the Gaussian process, where we can combine the data with our prior assumptions and analytically say, well, this is, this is what the updated understanding of the hypothesis space looks like. Um, and Gaussian processes are one of those sets of models, right? There are, there are many others. We're using them here because they're actually a very flexible class of uh, those models, but they're still severely limited. So we're in this sort of world where we'd like to be doing these really, really fancy things, but we're given, you know, like that, that sort of image of the paths across the fence, we're walking on certain paths. And so what we have to do is cleverly use those routes to answer the type of questions that we might have about the scientific area. So, a lot of our simulations, as I've sort of implied, might be based on these precise physical laws. So things like Newton's laws. So um, Bernoulli's model of the kinetic theory of gases was actually from conservation of energy. So Newton's laws, I think, led to everyone doing conservation of momentum. But now we do a lot with conservation of energy. That's a really cool thing to have, isn't it? Um, Modern climate simulation, you know, very high fidelity trying to sort of resolve. So I think the latest um, weather simulations in the UK are computed on a one kilometer grid for the United Kingdom. And, you know, they're going to buy a new supercomputer every time they buy a new supercomputer, they can they can get down to a final level of grid. So they play the game of life like we showed there before, but the boundary conditions are not these three simple rules. They're Navier-Stokes equations on the movement of air and whatever else is going on that, that allows us to predict the weather. And very cleverly, they use the same machine to predict climate. But what we see is that we can think about these physical laws happening at these different scales. So I've tried to give the whole scale of what we potentially might be interested in modeling here. So everyone here who's interested in a physical system should hopefully be able to say where they sit on this, um, on this scale. So at the bottom here, you've got like, I think that's roughly the Planck length. So uh, you know, we, we actually approximate the universe as continuous, but apparently it isn't because you've got Planck distances, it's fundamentally discrete at the low level, but look how much space you've got between that discreteness and the electron. So there's, this is a log scale here. So there's, a, a, there's how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, I think there's 10, 14, uh, so it's like that must be 10 to 21 or some, uh, minus 21, something like that. And humans, I put us here in the middle, you know, we're about a meter length, right? So that's the scale that we're operating on here. And then all the way up there to sort of the scale of the cosmos or the observable cosmos at 10 to the 27. So you could be operating on any of these different scales and you now have to make a choice. I mean, what, what do we do? Well, we don't compute the discreteness of the plant length when we're looking at the scale of the cosmos. We abstract things. So I've put supply chain in here as well. So if we're doing supply chain, the way you simulate supply chain, you don't say, allow me to just do the physics of molecules and as they move about the universe, right? You actually make an abstraction. You say there's a lorry, it's going to deliver parcels. There are human beings, this is what they do. And really, of course, those things are conforming to physical laws, but they're so far removed from those physical laws that it's kind of a bit unclear how they relate to them. And this can create problems. So like in Formula One simulation, you get this sort of, people do race simulations to try and understand their pit stop strategy. And um, there was this example from a long time ago, I was working with a team on one of these and my friend wrote the race simulation. It was brand new race simulation. It was working really, really well at the beginning. And then later I saw him like, you know, I think two years after and said, well, how's, you've got the race simulation, that's all working well. And I said, well, actually it seems to have gone a bit funny. And he said, it, 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 it feels like it's getting worse. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, things like this happen. So in the race simulation, the, the level of abstraction you go to is something like, I'm going to uh, allow one car to overtake another with a certain probability that is a function of the difference between their top speeds. So you have some sort of like difference between their top speed as input, some squashing function that goes between zero and one and say, overtake occurs on the next lap with some probability. So that's representing someone's instinct about how overtakes happen. 
So that was what our model did. And um, then they're sort of testing, they're running this model and the model says that they shouldn't pit their driver because the model knew that their driver would get stuck behind another driver when they exited the pit, right? And that their top speed wasn't enough to guarantee an overtake. Only all the humans knew that this driver that they were stuck behind was a development driver of the team. So he's never going to block that driver. There's a sort of contractual relationship there. And uh, he's always going to let this driver from the senior team pass quickly. So all the humans know that, but the model doesn't because it's just got this functional representation. What's the difference between the top speed? So everyone says, oh, okay, right. Well, so we'll fix that. So we'll put in an if statement around that. And we'll say, unless the driver is this specific development driver, in which case overtake next lap. To, to, to make the, the simulation better in some sense. But the problem with that is the thing that you've just put in is at a different level of granularity than your initial model was. So everyone can agree that that's kind of more correct, but the original model is working at this level of abstraction that we're not going to be dealing with interpersonal relationships between the drivers. We're not going to consider the fact that, you know, one driver hates another, or this has got a contractual relationship relationship and all these other things. And if you start adding that in on top of this more abstract model, you basically cause problems. And I mean, I don't know, these are, these are really hard problems to decide because it's very subjective, like what should be in and what should be out. But this is the sort of thing that goes wrong. And I think it was going wrong a lot in the pandemic, the simulations around the pandemic, like what should be in your epidemiological model of COVID. So for example, none of the models in the initial stages in the UK included face masks as an intervention, which you might think would have been useful but they did include lots of other detailed things that people thought were important. So that's super, super difficult. And that's the sort of abstraction choice you're making when you're in this sort of region here. You know, people also try and simulate the brain, how uh, a neuron fires and, and they're about the electrical simulations and whatever else. So you've got this whole range of areas where you're trying to simulate and you're having to make these decisions about abstraction as you do it in order to get the simulation correct in some sort of way that is computable. So in Formula One, you're looking to run those simulations you know, during the race to change your pit stop strategy. So you want answers in seconds, right? So you've got these compromises going on constantly. So what's very cool is sometimes we can abstract these smaller scales away. And that's one of my favorite examples would be, you know, statistical mechanics and um, Maxwell and Boltzmann and Gibbs. And, you know, this ability to sort of look at certain, to sort of say that we can say with like, I don't know, like, like close to 100% confidence. You should never say 100% confidence. You know, what the, I mean, it is, I mean, 100%. We know that the distribution of uh, velocities of air in this room is Gaussian because you can look at the statistics that emerge from doing the underlying statistical mechanics and say it's going to be, right? I mean, it, the scale of the number of molecules that's around us is such that it is true because all these central limit things effects are time, kind of happening. So there are these some occasions where you can abstract totally. And statistical mechanics is one of them. When we look at materials and start saying, well, we can look at the phase shift of this, this material from you know, gas to liquid, and we can predict the temperature. Well, if there's certain materials, we can do that very well with these abstractions that are using probabilities at that core level. That's sort of the stuff I talked about in the first lecture. But very, very often, we can't do that to that degree. We can't derive what that distribution must be. And in many, many interesting cases, we start with an inability to derive that and we start needing to introduce our own uncertainty into the system there. Um, and then of course, as we sort of been talking about, many of these, many of the properties we care about turn out to be emergent. Things that we can't even see that are in there when we're looking at the system in the low scale. So right at the moment, for example, supply chain crisis. And you're actually dealing with a situation where people haven't even simulated. So supply chain is a bad word because it's really, as someone was some pointed out in a meeting I was in the other day, I think it was Frank Kelly that said it. It's really a supply network, right? It's a network of different interactions across the supply chain, right? And now what we're seeing is when you disturb that network by concerns about, you know, where you've got COVID, you've got Brexit, you've got ships stuck in the um, Suez Canal, it does things that are difficult to predict. The emergent phenomena, and we're going to, you know, that's also one of the problems with climate. It's not that you can just reduce the carbon; you're pushing it into a certain direction where unknown emergent phenomena will happen. But then you can go all the way down to molecular uh, dynamic simulations. So, does anyone know what this is? <laughs> 
It's one of the most, so I always used to think, isn't it in, like nature, like there's a, which animal has a, a wheel? No animals have wheels, do you? No, you all have wheels because this is ATPAs. And it's, uh, it's the thing that up the top there, there's a sort of a little bit of compressing going on that, that produces ATP in the cells. This is, um, and so they know the structure of it very well, but all that sort of simulation, this is a molecular dynamic simulation to simulate how it's moving and why it's moving. Uh, so that's going on at this sort of really, really uh, sort of small scale. Um, it's quantum mechanics. So this is solving a multi-electron Schrodinger equation. Um, I, you know, that, I, I, I don't know if anyone's worked on that in computational chemistry type of area, but the number of electrons that are used here, I think are way above anything you can sort of practically do in any sort of seconds when you're doing a multi-electron Schrodinger equation. So that is computationally sort of extremely, extremely difficult. And that's just one molecule. So when you think about Alpha fold, for example, and if you start looking at what's gone on in alpha fold and all the pieces they brought together, it's this combination of physical understanding, data, machine learning models that can reconstruct this understanding, all going in together. It's extremely clever, but a number of different domains coming together in order to be able to predict the structure of these proteins um, from their sequence. So we do a lot of stuff in this, and one of the things for those of you who are on the MPhil or the part three program, so it's a 3D cafe at the moment, which has been Ching got an amazing job in Austria. Um, so there's MPhil projects available on, on this type of thing that if you're interested, uh, that you should, you should take a look at. I put the link in, in the notes. So this is Bing Ching, who's now in Austria. Um, you know, this is from her website and it's exactly this, it's a Dirac quote, but it's saying the same thing that we've been saying. Uh, the application of these laws leads to equations that are too complex to be solved. Um, approximate practical methods of applying quantum mechanics should be deployed, which can lead to an explanation of the main features of complex atomic systems without too much computation. So that's sort of her driving um, sense of what she's doing. So these are the sort of fellows that we've got in the department who are all will, will be interested in supervising projects in this area. Bianca's on computational biology. Challenger is on um, string theory. Uh, and Sarah is, uh, she's in psychiatry and she's interested in um, uh, schizophrenia um, and pulling different data sets together around that. So next time we're gonna start looking at emulation, which is going to be our trick for getting around these problems. So emulation is the process of saying, well, okay, that's very nice that you've got these sort of slow computational systems. What I'm effectively gonna do is I'm gonna build a function approximation to that slowness. So I'm gonna use the computation and then I'm gonna interpolate between the different operating points. I'm gonna make some sort of smoothness assumption and move between the different operating points on that system in order to try and get an understanding of what's going on without going through the whole simulation. So, the emulators themselves, the typical thing that we end up using is these sort of Gaussian process models. And the advantage of doing all this is, ironically, there's going to be a number of cases where we're going to use simulators that are faster to compute than the Gaussian process we emulate with them. You're going to see that happening quite a lot. The reason we'll be doing that is because we're trying to sort of teach the idea of these uh, emulation systems, and we don't want you to have to wait hours for your simulation to finish so that you can fit your emulator. But in general, the sort of role of these systems is you've got this fast to compute ability uh, to sort of replace the simulator, um, which also, if you've done it correctly, tells you when it doesn't know. It tells you what it's ignorant about. So you end up with this ability to sort of say, well, I'm computing the simulator here, but it turns out that it's not confident about what's going on here because that old Gaussian process plot. We're in a region where we've not seen data. So maybe I want to rerun the simulation or in a really complex system, acquire data from the real world even. Um, and that's going to be the focus of um, Friday's lecture. I'll stop there for now and see if there are any sort of questions or Carl Henrik can tell me if there's things I forgot to say. Questions? We've got a good time for questions today. So